Section 26, Letters 126 to 130. Letter of 126. Madame de Rosemonde to the Présidente de Tourvelle. I should have replied to you before, my amiable child, if the fatigue consequent on my last letter had not brought back my pains, which have once more deprived me during these last days of the use of my arm. I was most anxious to thank you for the good news which you have given me of my nephew, and I was no less eager to offer you my sincere congratulations on your own count. One is forced to recognize in this a real effect of providence, which by touching the heart of one has also saved the other. Yes, my dearest fair, God, who only wished to try you, has succored you at a moment when your strength was exhausted, and in spite of your little murmur, you owe him, methinks, your thanksgiving. It is not that I do not feel it would have been more agreeable to you if this resolution had come to you first, and that Belmont's had been only the consequence of it. It seems even, humanly speaking, that the rights of our sex would have been better preserved, and we would not lose any of them. But what are these slight considerations in view of the important objects which have been obtained? Does a man who has been saved from shipwreck complain that he has not had a choice of means? You will soon find, my dear daughter, that the sorrow which you dread will alleviate itself, and even if it were to subsist for ever and in its entirety, you would none the less feel that it was still easier to endure than remorse for crime and contempt of yourself. It would have been useless for me to speak to you earlier with this apparent severity. Love is an involuntary sentiment which prudence can avoid, but which it could not vanquish, and which, once born, dies only by its fine death or from the absolute lack of hope. It is this last case in which you are which gives me the courage and the right to tell you frankly my opinion. It is cruel to alarm one hopelessly sick, who is no longer susceptible to aught save consolations and palliation. But it is right to enlighten a convalescent as to the dangers he has incurred, in order to inspire him with that prudence of which he has need, and with submission to counsels which may still be necessary to him. Since you choose me for your physician, it is as such that I speak to you, and that I tell you that the little indisposition which you experience at present, and which perhaps demands some remedies, is nothing in comparison with the alarming malady from which your recovery is assured. Next, as your friend, as the friend of a reasonable and virtuous woman, I will permit myself to add that this passion which has subjugated you, already so unfortunate in itself, became even more so through its object. If I am to believe what is told me, my nephew, whom I confess I love, perhaps to weakness, and who indeed unites many laudable qualities to many attractions, is not without danger for women. There are women whom he has wronged, and he sets almost an equal price upon their seduction and their ruin. Indeed, I believe that you may have converted him. Never was there a person more worthy to do this, but so many others have flattered themselves with the same thought, and their hopes have been deceived, that I love better far to think you should not be reduced to this resource. Consider now, my dearest fair, that instead of the many risks you would have had to run, you will have, besides the repose of your conscience and your own peace of mind, the satisfaction of having been the principal cause of Valmont's happy reformation. For myself, I do not doubt, but that this is in large part the result of your courageous resistance, and that a moment of weakness on your part might have left my nephew, perhaps, in eternal error. I love to think so, and desire to see you think the same. You will find in that your first consolations, and I fresh reasons for loving you more. I expect you here within a few days, my amiable daughter, as you have announced. 
come and recover calm and happiness in the same spot where you had lost it. Come above all to rejoice with your fond mother that you have so happily kept the word you gave her, to do nothing unworthy of her or of yourself. At the Chateau de 30th October, 17. Letter the hundred and twenty seventh The Marquise de Merteuil to the Vicomte de Valmont. If I have not replied to your letter of the nineteenth, Vicomte, it is not that I have not had the time. It is quite simply that it put me in a bad humour, and that I found it lacking in common sense. I thought, therefore, that I could not do better than leave it in oblivion. But since you come back to it, since you appear to cling to the ideas it contains, and take my silence for consent, I must tell you plainly what I think. I may sometimes have had the pretension to replace in my single person a whole seraglio, but it has never suited me to make a part of one. I thought you knew this. Now, at least, when you can no longer be ignorant of it, you will easily imagine how absurd your proposal must have appeared to me. I, indeed, I am to sacrifice a fancy, and a fresh fancy, moreover, in order to occupy myself with you. And to occupy myself in what way? By awaiting my turn like a submissive slave for the sublime favours of your highness. Well, forsooth, you want a moment's distraction from that unknown charm which the adorable, the celestial Madame de Tourvelle has alone made you experience, or when you are afraid of compromising in the eyes of the seductive Cecile the superior idea which it is your good pleasure that she should preserve of you. Then, condescending even to myself, you will come in search of pleasures, less keen in truth, but without consequence, and your precious bounties, although somewhat rare, will, nevertheless, suffice for my happiness. You certainly are rich in your good opinion of yourself, but apparently I am not equally so in modesty— for however I may look at myself, I cannot find myself reduced to such a point. Perhaps this is a fault of mine, but I warn you I have many others also. I have in especial that of believing that the schoolboy, the mawkish Dancigny, who is solely occupied with me and sacrifices to me, without making merit of it, a first passion, even before it has been satisfied, who, in a word, loves me as one loves at his age, may work more effectively than you, for all his twenty years, to secure my happiness and my pleasure. I will even permit myself to add that, if it were my whim to give him an assistant, it would not be you, at any rate not at this moment. And for what reasons do you ask me? But to begin with, there might very well be none, for the caprice which might make me prefer you could equally cause your exclusion. However, I am quite willing, out of politeness, to give you the reason of my opinion. It seems to me that you would have too many sacrifices to make me, and I, instead of being grateful for them, as you would not fail to expect, should be capable of believing that you were still my debtor. You quite see that, far as we are from each other in our fashion of thinking— we cannot come together again in any manner, and I am afraid that it might need time, a long time, before I should change my sentiments. When I am converted, I promise I will inform you. Until then, believe me, make other arrangements and keep your kisses. You have so many better occasions to dispose of them. Adieu, as of old, say you. 
but of all it seems to me you took a little more account of me you had not relegated me entirely to minor parts and above all you were quite willing to wait until i had said yes before making sure of my consent be satisfied if instead of bidding you also adieu as of old i bid you adieu as at present your servant monsieur le vicomte at the chateau de thirty first october seventeen letter the hundred and twenty eighth the president de tourvel to madame de rosemonde I only received yesterday, madame, your tardy reply. It would have killed me on the instant, if my existence had still been in my own hands. But another is its possessor, and that other is Monsieur de Valmont. You see that I hide nothing from you. If you must consider me no longer worthy of your friendship, I fear even less to lose it than to retain it by guile. All that I can tell you is that— Placed by M. de Valmont between his death or his happiness, I resolved in favour of the latter. I neither vaunt myself on this nor accuse myself. I simply state the fact. You will easily understand after this what impression your letter must have made upon me, with the severe truths which it contains. Do not believe, however, that it was able to give birth to a regret in me, nor that it can ever cause me to change in sentiment or in conduct. It is not that I do not have cruel moments, but when I fear that I can no longer endure my torments, I say to myself, Valmont is happy, and all vanishes before this idea, or rather it converts all into pleasures. It is to your nephew, then, that I have devoted myself. It is for him that I have ruined myself. He has become the one centre of my thoughts, my sentiments, my actions— as long as my life is necessary to his happiness it will be precious to me, and I shall deem it fortunate. If some day he thinks differently, he shall hear from me neither complaint nor reproach. I have already dared to cast my eyes upon that fatal moment, and I have resolved on my course. You see now how little I need be affected by the fear you seem to have, lest one day Monsieur de Valmont should ruin me, for ere he can wish for that he will have ceased to love me, and what will then be vain reproaches to me which I shall not hear? He alone shall be my judge. As I shall have lived but for him, it will be in him that my memory shall repose, and if he is forced to admit that I loved him, I shall be sufficiently justified. You have now read, madame, in my heart— I preferred the misfortune of losing your esteem by my frankness to that of rendering myself unworthy of it by the degradation of a lie. I thought I owed this complete confidence to the kindness you have shown me. To add one word more would be to lead you to suspect that I have the vanity to count upon it still, when on the contrary I do myself justice in ceasing to pretend to it. I am with respect, madame, your most humble and obedient servant. Paris, 1st November, 17, blank. Letter the 129th, the Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil. Tell me then, my lovely friend, whence comes the tone of bitterness and banter which prevails in your last letter? Pray, what crime have I committed, apparently without suspecting it, which put you in such ill humour? You reproach me with having the air of counting on your consent before I had obtained it. But I believed that what might seem presumption in the case of everybody could never be taken between you and me for aught save confidence and since when has that sentiment done detriment to friendship or to love in uniting hope to desire i did but yield to the natural impulse which makes us ever place the happiness we seek as near to us as possible and you took for the effect of pride what was no more than the result of my eagerness 
i know mighty well that custom has introduced in such a case a respectful doubt but you also know that it is but a form a mere protocol and i was authorized it seems to me to believe that these minute precautions were no longer necessary between us methinks even that this free and frank method when it is founded on an old liaison is far preferable to the insipid flattery which so often takes the relish out of love <sighs> perhaps moreover the value which i find in this manner does but come from that which i attach to the happiness which it recalls to me but for that very cause it would be more painful still for me to see you judge of it otherwise <clears throat> that however is the only error which i am conscious of for i do not imagine that you could have thought seriously that there existed any woman in the world whom i could prefer to you and even less that i could appreciate you so ill as you feign to believe you have looked at yourself you tell me in this connection and you have not found yourself reduced to such a point i well believe it and it proves that you have a faithful mirror but could you not have drawn the conclusion with more ease and justice that i was very certain not to have judged you so i seek in vain for a cause for this strange idea it seems however that it is due more or less to the praises i have permitted myself to make of other women at least i infer it from your affectation of picking out the epithets adorable celestial seductive which i made use of in speaking to you of madame de tourvel or of the little volange but are you not aware that these words more often used by chance than from reflection are less expressive of the account one takes of the person than of the situation in which one finds oneself at the time of speaking and if at the very moment when i was keenly affected either by one or the other i was none the less desirous of you if i showed you a marked preference over both of them since in short i could not renew our former liaison except to the prejudice of the two others i do not find in that so great a matter for reproach it will be no more difficult for me to justify myself as to the unknown charm with which you seem to be also somewhat shocked for to begin with it does not result that it is stronger from the fact that it is unknown <laughs> who could give it the palm over the delicious pleasures which you alone know how to render always fresh as they are always keen i did but wish to tell you therefore that it was of a kind which i had not experienced before but i did not pretend to assign a class to it and i added what i repeat to-day that whatever it may be i shall know how to combat and to conquer it i shall bring even more zeal to this if i can see in this trivial task a homage to be offered to you as for the little cecile i think it hardly necessary to speak of her to you you have not forgotten that it was at your request that i charged myself with the child and i only await your permission to be rid of her i may have remarked upon her ingenuousness and freshness i may even for a moment have thought her seductive 
because in a more or less degree one always takes pleasure in one's own handiwork but assuredly she is not in any way of sufficient consequence to fix one's attention upon her and now my lovely friend i appeal to your justice to your first kindness for me to the long and perfect friendship the entire confidence which has since welded the bonds between us have i deserved the severe tone which you adopt with me but how easy it will be for you to compensate me for it when you like say but one word and you will see whether all the charms and all the seductions will detain me here not for a day but for a minute i will fly to your feet and into your arms and i will prove to you a thousand times and in a thousand manners that you are that you will ever be the true sovereign of my heart adieu my lovely friend i await your reply with much eagerness paris third november seventeen Letter the hundred and thirtieth, Madame de Rosemonde to the President de Tourvel. And why, my dearest fair, would you cease to be my child? Why do you seem to announce to me that all correspondence will cease between us? Is it to punish me for not having guessed what was against all probability? Or do you suspect me of having guided you willfully? nay i know your heart too well to believe that it can think thus of mine the pain therefore which your letter caused me is far less relative to me than to yourself o oh, my youthful friend i tell it you with sorrow you are far too worthy of being loved that ever love should make you happy ah what woman who was truly delicate and sensitive has not found misfortune in this very sentiment which promised her so much felicity do men know how to appreciate the woman they possess tis not that many are not honourable in their actions and constant in their affections but even amongst these how few know how to put themselves in unison with our hearts do not suppose my dear child that their love is like our own indeed they experience the same intoxication often even they bring more ardour to it but they do not know that anxious eagerness that delicate solicitude which causes in us those tender and constant cares of which the beloved object is ever the single aim the man's pleasures lie in the happiness which he feels the woman's in that which she bestows this difference so essential and so little noticed has however a very sensible influence on the sum of their respective conduct the pleasure of the one is ever to gratify his desires that of the other is especially to arouse them to please with him is but a means to success whereas with her it is success itself and coquetry with which women are so often reproached is nothing else than the abuse of this manner of feeling and by that very fact proves its reality in short that exclusive taste which particularly characterizes love is in the man naught but a preference serving at the most to enhance a pleasure which perhaps another object would diminish but would not destroy whilst in women it is a profound sentiment which not only destroys every extraneous desire but which stronger than nature and removed from its dominion allows them to experience only repugnance and disgust at the very point where pleasure seems to be born and do not deem that more or less numerous exceptions which one might quote can successfully contradict these general truths 
they are guaranteed by the public voice, which has distinguished infidelity from inconstancy for men alone, a distinction by which they prevail when they should be humiliated, and which for our sex has never been adopted, save by those depraved women who are its shame, and to whom all means seem good, which they hope can save them from the painful feeling of their baseness. I had thought, my dearest fair, that it might be of use to you to have these reflections, to oppose the chimerical ideas of perfect happiness, with which love never fails to abuse our imagination. The lying spirit, to which one still clings even when forced to abandon it, and the loss of which irritates and multiplies the sorrows, already too real, that are inseparable from a lively passion. This task of alleviating your pains, or of diminishing their number, is the only one I would fulfill at this moment. In disorders without remedy it is to the regimen alone that advice can be applied. The only thing I ask of you is to remember that to pity a sick person is not to blame him. Who are we, pray, that any of us should blame another? Let us leave the right to judge to him alone who reads in our hearts, and I even dare believe that in his paternal sight a host of virtues may redeem a single weakness. But I conjure you, my dear friend, guard yourself above all from those violent resolutions which are less a proof of strength than of entire discouragement. Do not forget that in rendering another possessor of your existence to employ your own expression, it is not in your power to deprive your friends of the part of it which they previously possessed, and will never cease to reclaim. Adieu, my dear daughter. Think sometimes of your affectionate mother, and believe that you will ever be, and above all else, the object of her dearest thoughts. At the Chateau de 4th November, 17th.